I remember the first time I heard Dr. Vandana Shiva. It was at my alma mater, Sept University, in I think 2015, and I was left in complete awe of her work, her activism, and her grace. She opened my eyes to a whole new world of seed saving, biodiversity, and feminism. The last time I saw her was a few days before the COVID lockdowns began. She had generously accepted our invitation to deliver the keynote lecture for the International Women's Week at the GSD. But since then, a lot has changed. The world has changed. So, for today's episode and this season's finale, I thought of having a candid conversation with her about the fears, concerns, and anxieties of a young architect. I'm Vaishnavi Shukla and this is Architecture of Center, a podcast where we highlight contemporary discourses that shape the built environment but do not necessarily occupy the center stage in our daily lives. We speak to radical designers, thinkers, and change makers who are deeply engaged in redefining the way we live and interact with the world around us. So So what I'll do is I'll frame my questions and today's conversation through the perspective of a young professional's unsettling worries because I don't think I can parallel or even compare to all the other big questions that you might get asked on a normal day. So I'll keep this um very light, very candid and we'll take it from there. Sure. Um So of course the last time we met this was one week before the lockdown and in your conversation in your talk you very briefly alluded to the virus and the potential that a small virus can have in terms of disrupting an entire planet so to speak and then of course looking back at it it seems like there's a certain ability of hyper engineered matter to disrupt life on earth and even when it comes to vaccines and everything that happened after but since that talk and now so many events have been related to our food systems uh so right from the farmers protest that that we saw last year in india to the war in ukraine and how it disrupted the global wheat supply so it seems like there are so many economic and geopolitical factors at play here My larger question is at this point I'm not sure where my food comes from. I am not sure at what cost that food comes um to me at and I don't know how to reconcile my identity as a consumer with all these various injustices that are involved in the food system. you know the the globalization of the food system is designed to erase any knowledge at any level it's an erasure and and if, if you know i've always seen the current neoliberal globalization of corporations as mimicking the colonial globalization except that in colonialism uh you know agriculture was transformed into producing raw materials mm. you know like cotton which is always given the clothing for people mm. then became the biggest raw material for the empire mm. leading to the colonization of america slavery for working those cotton plantations the indigo cultivation mm. the indigo revolt the difference between that period and today is in between was hitler's germany the dependence on oil yeah you know, 2 year 200 years of fossil fuel but 100 years of oil and oil used to then make chemicals and and that changed not just the way food is distributed but how it's produced mm. and the very fact that food is produced with new inputs means it is actually costlier food mm. um fossil fuels fossil fuel fertilizers because all chemicals are fossil fuel based 
and they're very costly to produce. The only way they have spread around the world, and I realized this when I first tried to study why did Punjab go so wrong? And I wrote my book called The Violence of the Green Revolution. And if you don't have subsidies, this won't spread. Mm. You have chemicals in, in uh, farming because of the subsidies, which means the taxpayers who get poisoned by the same chemicals are subsidizing mm. their poisoning without mm. their knowing it. Mm. I did a report three years ago on, uh, and we did a book called True Cost Accounting that j just in India, if you take the cost to and harm to society and the environment, just two externalities, every year just chemical harm is $1.3 trillion. Mm. But at that time, we weren't looking at the health costs, you know, when we did that wealth per acre. But you had the health cost, that's another. $1.52 trillion. So we are talking about the externalities of the dominant way of producing food as bigger than our GDP mm. that's formally measured. The new report we did, Our Daily Bread, we decided to look at what share goes to the farmer. And we found an average of 5%. UK has just done a new study, organ, or farmers groups there have done a study, 1%. Mm. But that, you know, the, it's not that the farmer, the farmer's getting 1% of what the consumer is paying, but then the farmer is also in debt for the seed, for the chemicals, for the machinery. And add it all up, it's a, I have called it a negative economy. I have a new book called, um, it's called Biodiversity, Agroecology and uh, Regenerative Organic Agriculture. So also published in the States, but it was first, you know, a publisher in India heard me and he said, I had no idea farming had science to it. Mm, mm. I thought organic was about trade and a brand. And I said, no, it's foundations is knowing the relationships, the science relationship. Right. So that book has come out and I have a whole chapter in that on this whole issue of true cost accounting. So when you ask, you know, what is it? What's the true cost? The true cost is unaffordable for the earth or for the people. This industrial globalized food system would not exist if true costs were being paid. Hmm. Yeah, the, the problem is <clears throat> globalization and industrialization has split. You know, any production system, the person who produces bears the costs, gets the profits and the margins. We have an industrial globalized food system where the produ farmer who's producing is losing. That's why we have 400,000 sure. farmers suicides in India. The people who are consuming don't know what they're consuming and they're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Mm. But the ones who are not producing, no consuming, but selling the inputs and controlling the system are walking away with trillions of dollars of profits. Mm. So it's a very dismembered system and we will not be able to make it whole till farmers and consumers start to connect. Mm. It's, it's now an ecological survival imperative. Mm. And it needs effort. All, all good work needs effort. You know, when people say, oh, but it's, it's, it, it takes work. I said, you were born by hard work by your mother. Tell <laughs> me a child who came into this world without labor. Yeah. You know, so labor is creation. And... Uh, and the farmers work very hard. And I think it's now time for consumers to do the hard work to connect. Mm. It's, it's, it's interesting you mentioned um, raw material um, and how all the basic necessities of life became sources for whole different set of industries and led to industrialization. But again, on your recommendation, I'm looking at new raw materials. Yes. Yeah. And... I remember to meet her. Yeah. Tried, yeah, but yeah. she was the main. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm looking at this raw material, which is um, Shoshana Zuboff. Uh, okay. Yeah, she she talks about our data and our activities that becomes raw material for a whole different way of capitalism. And this this goes into my next question because my next point of concern has to do with um, your emphasis on diversity. Now a lot of people have wrongly portrayed you as anti-globalization, which I know is not the case. But as a young designer, I often see that there's a relentless urge 
among people, among my clients, friends, to aspire for this modern global culture, whatever, whatever that, that is. And this reflects not just in the design briefs I get, where somebody would want a new house in India to look like a new house in Italy, for example, but also the kind of uh, food cultures that are developing in cosmopolitan cities. So you would have sushi and burgers and uh, pad thai and thai curry being now made in Indian households. Um, I'm not sure what I what I think about it, but it it seems like we are all headed towards this very fuzzy homogenous culture, which has no relation to the time and the place that we are living in or to our identity as people belonging from a certain geographical location. How do we make sense of that? You know, if you, <clears throat> because I've dedicated my life to first understanding nature through quantum theory, but understanding nature through ecology for a large part of my life, uh, I've understood that diversity emerges from self-organization. And self-organization means relationships in place. Mm. Yeah. So a rice variety becomes different according sure. to the context in which it's growing. Mm. And that's the reason we have such unique food cultures all over the world. You know, Gujarati food, so different from Bengali food, mm. so different from Kerala, so different from Maharashtra. Uh, nobody forced that culture. It evolved as the relationship to the plants of the place, the soil of the place, uh, and the best expressions mm -hmm. or, um, with deep knowledge right. of health and diet, because none of this is uninformed. Mm. It's deeply informed about what's good for the health of the soil and the, our health. Mm. Uh, Globalization has basically become, just like in the issue of costs, it's become a negative economy, a corporate globalization, which is not a meeting of autonomous locals. You know, that's internationalism at the political level. That's what the UN system is supposed to be. Mm. That is planetary in terms of Gaia, you know? that Gaia as a whole, as one mm. super organism, is made of many, many, many ecosystems, many, many other organisms. And, and that's what a truly global culture that is net, networked through evolved indigenous local cultures. And that's what in food brings health and quality, in clothing brings beauty, mm. you know? Now, the minute you have everyone wearing blue jeans, the poor people with wearing copy of Levi and the others wearing Levi, you get the boredom of uniformity. Mm. And that boredom of uniformity is an internalization of colonization. Colonization is basically not just material control over resources and territory and land, but it is a cultural cultivation of a sense of inferiority. Mm. You know, the superior tries to tell you you're inferior. That's what, uh, what was the person who was sent to India? Macaulay. Mm. When Macaulay said, this country is too rich, you know, we can't colonize it economically. They're too rich, but we can make them feel they're inferior. That everything they have is inferior. Everything we bring, even the junk we bring is superior. Mm. That's how we'll colonize them. So in a way, through corporate globalization based on neoliberalism, what's really happening is everywhere people are feeling inferior about who they are, what they wear, what they eat. And it's not, nobody's thinking through that, oh, sushi is tastier than my kakra, you know? And uh, they just, thoughtlessly mimicking, and that's what consumerism. I will mention a thing, uh, something. Uh, but around the time when W2 hadn't yet been signed, but the debates on GATT were happening, and I was part of the International Forum on Globalization that actually stopped W2 in Seattle. Mm. Um, and by the way, there is a new film 
besides my book, independently people have made a new film called Seeds of Vandana Shiva, which is yes, very good footage. Of course, yes. It's a good footage of the Seattle protests. Uh, and it has back, Mark Ruffalo inside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, I was debating, you know, I, I was debating, I think, the trade secretary, commerce secretary of the US uh, in Washington. And, uh, and he said, democracy now is buying anything from anywhere at any time. And I said, no, democracy is the right to produce mm. according to ecological and social responsibility with doing the least harm to the earth and creating the best well-being for everyone in society. So this idea of the right to consume actually fits right into the right to control by the corporations. And so we are all dumbly moving down that way, you know, to the extent that in these 30 years of globalization, everyone was airing a sign. And now when I walk, you know, in airports or something, you know, people will, young women will come up to me and say, are you a nun? You know, they don't imagine the sari to be an Indian clothing. Mm. That's how much we can forget. That's how much we can not remember. But because you started this question showing Susanna Zubov's book, which very powerfully shows that we are being reduced to the new raw material, but also the new dump yard, you know? Mm. Every mm. industrial system has to have raw material somewhere which they extract, but that generates waste, which has to be generated some, put throw away yeah. in some, somewhere else. And India has become a land of piles of waste, which we didn't have before. Mm. Um, I think, you know, I had read the book before I met you. But besides the fact that that little virus taught us so much, the management of the virus taught us that the surveillance system is yes. totally in place. And it is the new economy, yeah, mm -hmm. as she says, capitalism. So mm -hmm. it's not just political control. It is a generator of super profits yeah. through the control. And, and again, it ties back into um, what, what you talk about in your book as well, you know, uh, um, oneness versus the 1% and how all the profits are actually controlled, not just by that one person, it's probably like 0 0.001%. I think there are five, six zeros before the one. Actually, yeah, yeah. Reality. It's it's ridiculous if you think about the scale and the power that mm. that that zero 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 one percent holds. But my next question is going to be related to a personal guilt that I face on a day to day basis, and the many violences that we subject our land and our soil to. Um, and and this is this guilt is real when, as an architect, I break ground for a new site, there's of course tremendous joy in building something on plain ground, but also the realization that the ground is really not plain. Um, it is home to millions of pests and insects. And you talk about the role of pests and insects in organic farming and how they kind of um, self-sufficiently manage a whole different system, which reduces the need for fertilizer or discards the need for fertilizers. Um, that this plain ground is also home to the organisms that my naked eye cannot even see. And it feels like through the act of building, I am disturbing a natural ecosystem. It almost seems like I'm, I'm subjecting that land, that ground to a violence that it could have not been subjected to. And come to think about it at a very global scale, and this is a micro action, when you multiply this, um, the nature of the profession, the nature of the industry is such that once we've done this intervention on the land, that it can never go back to what it used to be because one, our cities are growing at a scale that we never, we were never prepared for them to grow at. And then of course, uh, our population is at an all time high. And there's still that kind of an aspiration to move to the city and live in a city. And so there's also tremendous migration in terms of the rural to the urban, even in terms of seasonal labor, we used to see construction workers still going back to home um, for your holy plantation, for harvest season. And that seems to be 
reducing that relationship between between humans and land or the kind of interventions we have between us and the land how how do we really think about this you raised the very serious questions because uh, you know removing people from the land has been the enterprise for the simple reason that people who are on the land are free mm. You know, you're on the land, the small person. When I organized 500,000 farmers rally in uh, uh, Cabin Park in uh, Bangalore mm. in 1993, be before signing GAD, and uh, I invited many people, including the Environment Minister of Brazil, the Environment Minister of uh, Ethiopia, who are dear friends of mine, and um, the Brazilian uh, Minister. Jose Lutzenberger, you know, he's sitting with me and scribbling away from, from the stage. And he says, you know, now I understand why they're so scared of small farmers. Mm. You, you remember the protests of India and protests in Netherlands right now. Mm. You know, they go carrying on. Um, and then while we were chatting on the stage on paper, you know, we realized that really it's only in farming that the earth and you can produce what you need. Mm. And in that context, of course, people made their own homes, you know? I, I remember in the early days when I used to do seed saving, Urissa still had a lot of diversity. Mm. And I said to the farmer, why are you still using your old seeds? And he said, because the new seeds make such horrible thatch, the water comes through. It's only the very fine straw, the long straw of the old, that gives me a home. Mm. Yeah, in Orissa, they were saving old varieties for their housing mm. and the thatch. And of course, this displacement, you know, industrial farming is a displacement of people. Globalization is a further displacement. Uh, you said the population is increasing, but of course it is, but what's happening is the country is being emptied out. Mm. And I wrote, the early, one of the early reports on GATT, I remember quoting um, agriculture secretary of uh, the United States, who I think in the 70s said, we have to squeeze the last farmer off the land, like we squeeze the last bit of toothpaste from a toothpaste tube. So that is what has flushed people out of the cities, out of the villages, into the cities. And, you know, I'm having to deal with a land mafia because, you know, I've saved area for farming and of course everyone's eyes on it because all around us everything's gone and it's a whole new challenge you know living in a village was so safe and now the eyes are on this mafia so of course there's that violence but when you talk about your profession uh, don't ever talk think about it with guilt think about it in terms of the larger context of which you are a part mm. and and, you know, so many of you all are, are working on ecological agriculture. Yeah. And ecological design. And, uh, and the first principle on any activity has to be to make the harm minimum. Mm. Right? I mean, even the Atharva wave in those times was saying, I have to pierce through your heart, Mother Earth, to grow the food I need. But mm. I commit myself I will not pierce deeper than I absolutely need, need to. to. You know, and I think that principle is the basic principle. And then there's so much innovation now in, you know, I promoted gardens of hope. Mm. So create the home for whatever species can we can. They were showing from China entire cities now being forest cities, mm. um, you know, and uh, that what, you know, the soil is what's nurturing everything on the land, but you can bring soil to a high level too with you. Yeah? And that's where the new creativity has to come. But I do not treat as inevitable the idea that farmers must be wiped out. Mm. You know, that's why I went in the earlier part of the food course, I said, we must connect to farmers. Mm. 
and creating farming communities. Two things that designers can do, and yeah, I advise the C40, you know, the mayors mm. of the small of the cities. So I advise them, they call me up and on to tell them. Yeah. And the Barcelona mayor is very, very progressive. Um, as is the Paris mayor. Uh, I've said the two things around food that must be done that have been destroyed by these ideas of the economy and apartheid between farming out there and food out there and consumers here, that first food can be grown everywhere. Mm. Yeah. Maybe not large amounts of cereals and grains. Sure. But definitely a large amount of other things. And, you know, mm. it's it, because it's all fed into each other. We had an agriculture that reduced agriculture to poor cereal commodities. Mm. Just because they could be traded long distance. Sure. But we don't eat just that. We eat our dal and roti. Yeah. You know? And we eat it with lots of sabjis. <laughs> And sabjis are best grown closest to where you eat. eat. Okay. So that bit of food production definitely can move into design mm. of housing and architecture. Just today or day before, yesterday, there was an article on how the tomato growers are destroying their tomatoes. Because, you know, when the World Bank imposed the IMF, uh, World Bank IMF imposed the structural adjustment in 1991, that's when they have framed the laws against which the farmers are protesting, except that the laws were introduced now. Mm. Um, that they have said we, India shouldn't be growing grain. India should be growing tomatoes, potatoes, onions. So some places it's called top, tomatoes, onion, onion potatoes. potatoes. Some places it's called pot, mm. potato, onion, tomatoes. Yes. Uh, and, and but wherever you see, the, if the large stretches are only going tomatoes, with cost of hybrid tomato seed is one lakh a kilo. It needs chemicals, it needs irrigation, and then it's selling for one rupee a kilo. The seed you bought in one lakh, the product is one rupee. And you can't even the, cover the cost of taking it into the town to sell it. So I think we have to stop, especially for perishables, for vegetables. Mm. We need to move the production more and more into cities. It's interesting you're saying this right now because um, one of the younger guests on this season is a graduate of SPA Delhi. He's an architect. And he did a speculative design project just uh, thinking out loud, what if Delhi was to become an agro city in 2015? What if all the public gardens with lawns that guzzle a lot of water was very unsustainable? Again, gardens being a very colonial construct. What if we convert all the gardens and public spaces into farmlands? And what if farmers, instead of uh, being disconnected as rural migrant workers, what if farmers were seen as service providers? Could we then build a new economy where cities could have urban farmlands and farmers come as service providers. But just, just because uh, you mentioned- but I would still say not all food should grow in cities, cannot. Sure. And not our, farm, our farmers should be only service providers because you know having dedicated my life since 84 <laughs> to the autonomy of the farmer, you know, I, I would still like farmers taking care of the land. The land, yeah. they are. Yeah. You know, they have a vocation there. Yeah. Um, so the second issue I've always told, in, and that's related to this, that the cities is one is grow more food. And I remember after the Paris Agreement, the environment minister of Paris had asked me in a similar way a question, and I'd said this, and they put into the urban housing design that you had to have gardens. To pass your design, you had to have gardens in your balconies or on your terraces. But the second is because, like I said, not everything can be grown in the city. Cities take care of their water. Mm. There's something called a watershed. But they don't take care of their food, which is the mm. basic metabolism. So we need food sheds for every city. Mm. Not by thoughtless people who don't know what a city is, know what a country is, know what food is, not what human beings are, but through relationships, living relationships of those who are in the city 
and the farmers and the producers. We know how much land a person needs. So just like we managed in those days to totally distort India's farming to say Punjab will grow rice and wheat for everyone in India and you won't grow anything. Mm. You know, you will let your ragi disappear. You will let your, uh, all your millets disappear. And, you know, the reason we have the crisis we have is we're having a crisis in Punjab, but we're having a crisis everywhere else. Mm. So instead of that model of one region, region feeding only two cereals and, and then torturing people because the rice eaters don't want to eat wheat and the white wheat eaters don't want to eat rice. If, you know, the, you talked about someone else thinking about food in the city, we also should think about livelihoods on the land, food for the country and the city. I don't know how familiar you are with Liebig's work. He was the person who did the, the founder of modern organic chemistry. He's the one who really did all the work on what plants need, nitrogen, mm. but they turned it into an input and he rebelled against it. He said, this is not what I was saying. And he wrote a book called uh, something on recycling. Mm. And, and I was asked to do a few years ago, a forward to the English translation. The original is in 1800 German. It's amazing in this book. He's saying, no, this is not what I said. This is what I meant. I meant the circulation of nitrogen. I meant the circulation of phosphorus, not producing commodities. Mm. And he used the word metabolic rift. Mm. Marx picked it up from him and talked about the metabolic rift. And what we are suffering is not just a metabolic rift between the country and the city, but a metabolic rift within the city itself and within our bodies. The disease is a metabolic rift. Mm. So I think food is an amazing teacher to help us redesign relationships of humans with the earth, of cities with the country, of every person in the city with their food and their identity. And so much can happen lowering the ecological footprint lowering the emissions of greenhouse gases. This is the work I've done. When I wrote Soil Not Oil, this is what I was talking about. Increasing biodiversity, not, in, not just in the rural areas. See, if only Punjab grows rice, goes food for the country, it grows rice and wheat. Mm. But when Punjab was growing food for itself, it was growing 250 crops. So the minute you're closer, the closer you are in terms of producers and consumers, the more you can diversify. Uniformity is a result of centralization. And if we want to bring biodiversity back and we need biodiversity for the planet, for the biodiversity itself, but also managing the climate and for our health, all research is showing without biodiversity, our gut microbiome is getting totally desertified. So to reverse the desertification on the land and desertification in our gut, biodiversity is imperative. Biodiversity imperative can only be fulfilled by tightening the relationships from where food is produced and where it's consumed, making that distancing short. Mm. My last question has to do with um, the role of gender. And mm -hmm. uh, you talk extensively about the infrastructure of care. And how, of course, you're a pioneer, you coined the term ecofeminism, and you point out how a lot of the injustices that we see in the world right now in our food systems and our life right now have to do because there's been an inherent gender inequity in the way we function. Now, I sometimes shy away from identifying as a feminist because I feel like if I ever use that word out in the open, there's a certain connotation of, you know, women being anti-men in some regards, or women, um, how do I even put it? It's just like, you hate everything in the world, but women. It's, it's that kind of a identity that people often associate feminism with. And 
I feel like if I were to ever raise my voice in this male dominated industry where on a day to day basis, I go to sites, I'm often the only woman there. I work uh, in an industry that is full of men that if I ever was to raise my voice for an injustice that I am seeing, or if I was to take on the role of an activist, that I cannot probably be associated with the broad idea of feminism because that would just probably portray me in a very different light. Now, at heart, I know I am a feminist in a lot of the ways that I, I mean, I run a practice where we are all only women and that's a very conscious affirmative action where I do want to try and change the narrative in whatever little way I can. I try to get the projects documented by female photographers, work with more female vendors, try to do it in my very subservient way that I can. But I find myself shying away from taking the role of an activist when I need to. And because you've done it with so much of grace and poignance and so much of courage, how does one really switch roles from, say, for example, you being a physicist, you being a uh, somebody who runs this wonderful foundation to you being an activist as well. And are those two roles often mutually exclusive? Do you compartmentalize them or does activism become a way of life? Um, first, I did not create the word ecofeminism. I wrote a book with Maria Mies right. because the our publishers asked us to, you know, they had, I had written Sting Alive and it was a bestseller. Mm. And Maria had written a book called um, patriarchy and capital accumulation on a world scale. And they said, why don't the two of you write a book together on ecofeminism? So they gave the title. Mm. And we, we both are ecofeminists in the sense we are ecological and we are feminists. Mm. And we were bringing the two together. Uh, but it was Francoise, uh, a French philosopher, who you first used it in 1975 in mm. France. Um, you talked about you know, uh, the hesitation of using the word feminist. Uh, part of it is the way it has been caricatured, mm. you know? And, and anyway, all along, you know, I remember right from the beginning, feminism in India was about social justice, always. A large part of the feminism about the West was me. Mm. It's about me, you know? And when the Beijing conference took place, that's when structural adjustment was happening. That's when we were talking about, you know, the structures of patriarchy. And in the West, women were still talking about atomized liberation. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think one should ever worry about the word. Mm. I've never, I've never worried about the word. You know, I never used the word organic when I started. I used to work, use the word non-violent farming. Mm. Then I found that there's a system called organic. So I helped contribute, build that system, the science of it, the economy of it. Now there's a massive assault on organic. Sure. And I'm not going to stop using that word, you know? Mm. Uh, because if, if your intention is to silence me, uh, I will not be silenced. Uh, but speaking can take place in different ways, yeah? And, and to me, living truth is speaking. And you all don't always need an adversary. It's the part you, you choose. And you ask the question about, you know, I see my, my role as a scientist exploring nature, functions, relationship, and an activist working to transform. Sure. But I don't jump yeah. across boxes. I'm not in boxes. These are not mutually exclusive. For me, I have never ever acted without doing deep study. So it's only because I'd done the Punjab study on the violence of the Green Revolution that I then became active on agriculture. When I studied intellectual property rights, everything about what was happening in WTO, yeah. that's when I said, I will start saving seeds. So 
So thinking is an understanding of the direction your action should take. Mm. And that's a continuum. And that comes from deep knowledge. It comes from deep knowledge. And the more knowledge you have, the more you act the right way and activism as again, a, a box, a, a group of people who go there and shout on streets, that's a wrong model. Activism for me is a commitment, an ethical commitment to not accept passively mm -hmm. in violence against the earth and your fellow beings or yourself. Non-acceptance of that violence is a path of nonviolence. The path of nonviolence is activism. And a knowledge of how things are related is what shows what is violent and what is not violent. Mm. So that knowledge and the right action are totally one. In any way, you know, I've, I've done my quantum theory, and quantum theory is nothing like an excluded middle. Mm. It's always, you know, you could be a particle and you could be a, a wave, but mm. you're, it's the same quanta. Mm. You don't become a different. Uh, the fact that different expressions can take place doesn't make your being different. Expressions are pluralistic. We are the civilization of Bahuda. Everything, you know, um, I, I, I keep a pile of books sometimes when I have to put up, you know, and they do the photos <laughs> and all, they force me to put the, uh, the iPad up. And so I have to raise it on a pile of books. And one of the books that's raising my height is a beautiful book called Lalita Sehesuna. Lalita is the divine Yes, feminine. yes, of course. Sehesuna, Lalita, she plays, huh? she's playing. And what, Sehesuna, a thousand names. Mm. So a thousand ways of expression. Ganga ke ek hazar naam. Sab ke sehs naam hai. So I, I really feel we should use the plurality of what we are as a civilization mm. much more creatively in our times. Mm. Including in defining our own thinking and our own actions. Right. That's a, that's a very beautiful thought because I would always... Think of it as, um, you know, sticking out like a sore thumb if I was to just like be, you know, this is what I believe this is, but I felt maybe my way to do it would be to start really small and then just, you know, yeah, grow it the way yeah. I would see it growing. So, so the way, you know, I've lived a long life, you know, it's my 70th year. And... Anyway, when you know, I chose to do seeds, I chose to do ecological agriculture, I chose to follow Chipko, what could be a more beautiful action of love than hugging what you want, love, want to protect, exactly. you know? And that's why our movements are so different, you know? Mm. Hugging the trees, you know, is where I learned my ecological feminist. Um, but I've realized at the deepest level that, again, coming back to, Susanna Zuba of surveillance capitalism, you know, one part of it is extracting your data. Second part of it is behavior modification. Sure. So the behavior modification is just like everyone in Levi jeans, everyone eating McDonald's, everyone thinking the same way, uh, that in a world that's designing that deep level of controlled uniformity, yeah. doing it your way. And reinforcing that again and again and again. Mm -hmm. So doing it your way becomes the ultimate activism, not as the shouting out there, but the change that's needed. Mm. Activism is the change that's necessary. Mm. So Dr. Shiva, you just had a new book that came out. Um, my last question always is what's next? Um, what are you working on? What do you look forward to? Um, you know, part of what I want to do 2023 is work much more closely with women at the grassroots. Mm. I work very closely with them, but I work very closely with them for facilitating their practices sure. that make their lives better. 
but they have deep knowledge. It's again, the knowledge that's being forgotten and erased, you know, like I, I joke with them because, you know, I'll go to a village and they'll be celebrating Karwa Chaut up in the Pahar. And I said, we've never had Karwa Chaut here, but you know, it's in the movies and, and then everyone's doing Karwa Chaut. So yeah. I, we, we don't want uh, Karwa Chautization of our culture. So I want to work much more closely with women in the rural areas and in the different rural areas we work. We work in Garhwal, in Bengal, in Maharashtra. Uh, I want to work with them to articulate another view of climate change, another mm. view of economy, another view of politics, another view of knowledge. And maybe out of that later, I, I might write a book, but right now I just want to find creative ways to not let this erasure take place. You know, to me, really, women, women looking through the jali to see the moon, when they have thousand festivals of this flower and this vegetable and this tree, you know, and it's, it's they're forgetting it themselves, but they haven't forgotten it totally. Yeah. But we as a civilization are forgetting it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so, uh, that's what I'm going to put a lot of my time on. As you know, I'm my, my understanding of the climate change was always from the soil. You know, that's yeah. why I've talked about soil at all. But the women have even deeper knowledge. Mm. And I think, you know, we, we've reached such an absurd situation in the way every debate is so polarized, you know. And this ignorance is fighting this ignorance, you know. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I really want to bring, you know, both love and knowledge of our people more to the foreground. Thank you so much for taking the time and just just talking. Thank you so much, Dr. Shiva. Thank you. Lovely seeing you again, Vishni, and the very best for your activism and your work. It's just the same. <laughs> they are not two different things. Special thanks to Ayushi Thakur for the research and design support and Kahan Shah for the background score. For guest and topic suggestions, you can get in touch with us through Instagram or our website arcofcenter.com, both of which are A-R-C-H-O-F-F-C-E-N-T-R-E. -F -F -E. And thank you for listening.